What's up everybody? Welcome back to Sales Remastered. My name is Daniel. I'm your host and in this episode I'm going to dedicate to all the loan officers out there. I'm going to share with you a more efficient way to conduct the initial 1003, the initial sales conversation in a way that you're going to convert at a higher amount than you may be doing right now. And as far as your current attempts to complete this sales application or this sales conversation, your current method may have worked but the market now is now changed. And so without the proper guidance and proper script or the right script, you may have a difficult time going into 2018 with more of a challenge in market with regards to interest rate, pricing, and of course the neighborhood broker who's just whoring out their price. And so I'm gonna share with you a few very very, very helpful tricks on how to efficiently conduct the sales conversation, which happens to be your initial 1003. All right, so to all my loan officers out there, as a manager of a loan officer team, I manage a team and I also produce, meaning that I currently do refinances. So I'm doing a sales conversation every day. And it's the same process that I've shared with my team. It's the same process that I've shared with hundreds and thousands of loan officers across the nation over my experience in being a loan officer over the last two decades. And so the sales conversation, the initial 1003 is actually where a lot of the selling happens. It's the, it's really the x-ray it's your it's your initial interview where you're able to dig up a lot of the correct information you should focus your time on where I see time and time again most uh, loan officers have a difficult time in creating the pipeline that they need or the momentum that they need to fund X amount of units so that they hit their top tier and so my goal here in this video is to show you a more efficient way to conduct the initial sales application so that you have enough leverage to sell a higher rate or sell more fees than your prospect was initially expecting. And so I want to give you an example. Now I'm going to use this board here and I'm going to draw essentially what I want to refer to as the 1003 conversation. And the reason why I'm putting it in the line with this being start and then ultimately here is the finish. Keep in mind that this finish is not the pitch. This is not actually selling it yet. This is just from open to close on the initial phone conversation. As the market shifts into a higher rate market and pricing's change, we have to give our consumers and our prospects a little time to catch up. Because they're not plugged into the market like you and I are, they may be about three to six months behind, assuming that interest rates are still in the threes or that 2.5, 15 year fix that they saw in the commercial two or three years ago. And so as the market adapts, we'll notice that in the initial conversation, there's a lot of things that are thrown our way that can prohibit us from completing the actual sales application. And so my, my number one recommendation to you is consider not doing a one call close. Whatever outfit you work for, whatever CRM you have, or no matter how strong your support group is, I would strongly recommend that you avoid a one call close. And you might be thinking like, well, Daniel, I'm just a one call closer. I'm a strong closer. Good for you. But if you want, really want to increase your efficiency and gain loyalty with no question, the strongest way to do it is actually set up a two call close system. And so on the second call, you're more likely to have digested the correct information you've extracted from the sales conversation. It's kind of like, you know, really taking time to to bullet point what motivates your prospect. And if you, you're not able to do that initially right away or within a span of five to 10 minutes, you may be missing out on benefit to ultimately sell your prospect to keep them loyal to you, to not shop you. And so my, my other recommendation is that when doing a two call uh, close strategy, you have an increased chance of ensuring that the decision maker is there. You're gonna have a decision influencer and then you're gonna have a decision maker. You wanna make sure that both parties parties are available at the time that you go over the pitch attempt or your sales presentation. And so I want to illustrate out here with you that the start to finish within this timeline or within this line, certain things need to happen, um, such as like building rapport, building trust, you know, talking, getting to know each other. This is like the first date. But what happens most of the time is that at the very beginning of the sales conversation is when loan officers or us as salesmen, we like to go in for the kiss real quick. 
and that could be for multiple reasons. It could be because we have a busy day. It could be because you know we didn't mean to take the lead. Now we're stuck on this call. Or it could be because we have been so deflated from seeing our numbers shoot up to down to up to down. You know that fluctuation. It's very it, it's very straining. It can it can really really fatigue you out both mentally and physically. And so that's just something that we have to endure. But I'm going to show you a way where you may have to lessen that that endurance so you don't have to go through that pain, you don't have to go through that torture. And it really has to do with conducting the sales conversation very very efficiently. And I'm going to show you how. Now, a lot of the leads that we take, mind you, because at some time we're, we are dealing with bottom of the barrel leads and these are basically people who did not take advantage of the refinance time or they simply couldn't have refinanced and you'll find that a lot of leads that you talk to probably shouldn't even complete the full application to begin with now i'm not telling you to prejudge or pre underwrite the loan file but there are certain pieces that make up a loan like pillars and if you don't have these pillars then you don't have a loan you don't have a bridge and so a pillar example could be income Another pillar example could be credit history or seasoning from bankruptcies, foreclosures. Another pillar could be capacity, like do they even have the equity to even do this type of refinance that they want. And so you have to consider those things because if it's missing one of those pillars, then you know how to treat it and whether or not they're worth that full 30 to 45 minute conversation that you're first going to have with them and this is where the sale takes place. Now in my history or at least in my experience, what I notice why most loan officers fail is because we go straight into sales, meaning that right from the very beginning after your intro pitch, and it could be, hey, good afternoon, thanks for calling my company, how can I help you today? And the prospect could tell you, well, you know what, Daniel, before I even give you any information, I just need to know, can you beat this price? And so instead of getting objections here closer towards the finish, right, you're, they're getting objections here. And because of everything that a loan officer holds on their plate, from callbacks to putting out fires to dealing with that process or to get that file through to the next level to ordering appraisals to doing whatever you have to do on your on your calendar, sometimes we can just feel like we're always in this constant rush. And it's it's actually our temptation that puts us into a position where we feel like we have the right or the audacity to sit there and talk about numbers and go over price in the very beginning. When you haven't even done this portion of the conversation where you gather whether or not they have those pillars, why would I talk about a pricing on a program or a product if I know that this prospect does not have the capacity, they don't have income, they don't have the credit sufficient history or seasoning that's required for the underwriting guidelines. There's a lot of things that still needs to be discovered. But here's the thing, is because we look at that as kind of a daunting experience, like it's the grind, right? It's the, oh, it's gonna take so long, you know, this person probably might not even buy. And this is where we get in our own way. As loan officers, we start to think like, oh man, this person's never gonna buy because their last name is this. Or man, this is such a small loan amount, I'm not gonna make no money on it. Or man, this is, man, this is probably a mobile home. I'm probably just gonna, this is, this is never gonna work out, they sound lazy. Whatever excuse we put in front of ourselves, that ultimately becomes the reason as to why we don't get that momentum that we need to build the pipeline that we need in order to, to stay relevant and stay paid. And so what I wanted to do is introduce you to the reason why. Why most loan officers fail at the very beginning of initial application is because they go into objections way too early. They go into pricing. Um, in other words, they're negotiating. And so once, once the intro is said and once the first objection comes in because of all that negative energy that they have within our, our mindset as a loan officer, like, man, I'm never gonna have no time to go through this. Man, this guy's gonna sweat me the entire time on pricing and rates and fees. And this is right after we just saw a rate sheet in the morning that said pricing got worse. And so you have all these, these, these negative energies, right? That's just push, pushing you and pulling you in different directions. And we don't know what to do with it. We don't know where to go. But here's the thing is that if you go into pricing right here and right at the very beginning before you get to know your prospect, then the chances are you're not going to be able to sell that prospect. If anything, you're going to, you may say something that that prospect was not wanting to hear and now you've lost their interest to conduct this full application to figure, not, figure out whether or not the pillars are even there to con conduct the refinance to begin with. And so I get a common question through my DM as well as through email is, Daniel, how can I 
what can I do to improve my chance of making a sale? And this is it. This, it's it, all within your first initial sales conversation. And so I want to illustrate it out even further. What I believe is there are four steps that you need to do within your first sales conversation. And the step number one, is trust. And the reason why I say trust is because at the very beginning of the sales conversation, you'll notice in my sales script, if you have not downloaded a copy, go to salesremaster.com. It's going to say um, how to boost your sales uh, and it's going to ask for your name and your email. If you put in your name and your private email, I won't spam you, I won't sell or rent your information. I'm just going to send you over a script along with, a, with some literature that I wrote up that has to do with three things to keep you relevant and keep you paid in sales. It's a modern day. This is modern time advice. This isn't a sales book from 1999. This applies today. And so when you download the sales script, you're going to notice within the verbiage, I say, you know what, before we begin, I want to make sure I'm not wasting any of your time. I want to ask a few basic questions just to make sure I can even go further with this phone conversation. And there's something powerful about that. And I believe it's because you are demanding the trust. You're not just saying, hey, you know what, um, before I even try and sell you, let's just make sure I can even talk to you first. And there's something about that that puts you apart from every other salesman that just you know acts as if they can help anyone and everyone and everything is okay. And so I think by setting yourself into a different state or, or putting you within a different bracket and differentiating yourself right away from the very beginning, using that, that verbiage within that script is very powerful. And so it's gonna put you in a more trustworthy spotlight. And then the second portion is you actually have to hear. And why I say hear is because most loan officers just wanna talk. Man, I, I hear it all the time. It's like you're not even letting the, the prospect talk to you. And we think that we have to talk all the time because we just have to fill in the white noise, right? We have, there's that awkward silence. And so we'll result to, oh, so how's the weather? <laughs> or, oh, did you catch that game last night? You might push a lot of prospects off. More importantly, it's gonna come off like a salesman. You might just push the wrong button or probably talk to someone who has no time to chit chat. Let them demonstrate the chit chat or let them be the one to start the chit chat. Don't, don't bring anything that's off the subject at a point where you're just trying to get the, the momentum moving throughout the sales conversation. And so what I want you to do is I really want you to try hearing. And the only way they can truly hear the words that they say, the background that they're in, the words they use like I want or I need or I would like to see or I would like to um, you know, hear about. There's certain things that they're going to tell you, but you won't be able to listen to it unless you hear it. And so how do you hear it? How you hear it is you have to memorize your script. Your script almost has to be on autopilot, meaning your sales conversation is happening, but your focus is really on the atmosphere. It's on, it's on the environment. And so I can always say my sales script because it's just a repetitive process. But what happens is most salesmen use that repetitive process in order to multitask what they're doing in the background. So what they're doing in the background is they're changing screens or they're sending that last email or they're messing with their account calendar where, where you should use that that secondary focus instead of you know rushing to get your CRM up and and making sure you're, you're putting information in, in, the, in the correct lines is use that ability to also put focus on the background on the words on their verbiage on the power words they use are they using the words like terrific or interesting you know these are words that they use to explain certain emotions and this is things that you could be really taking note on and so after you get familiar with your script and you get more comfortable with your script you're able to put that script on autopilot so it's coming out of your it's coming out of your head it's coming out of your mouth and it's just automatic and so when it becomes automatic you're able to do two things at once because you're not necessarily thinking of the words you just have that down packed and this is the option that we have as salesmen to use that ability to pay attention to things that matter instead of paying attention to your next door neighbor instead of paying attention to you know that email that just came in from processing instead of paying attention to the score on the game that's showing on the TV on the wall just put your focus on that prospect and they'll actually feel it. So when you hear what they have to say, it gives you an advantage to continue the momentum of completing this application. The next phase 
is intent. Intent. There's a difference between intent and goal. Meaning that most of our sales conversations, we at some point will ask the prospect, well, what are you looking to do, right? Or what's your goal? Or how can I help you? And we already know through our experience that they're always gonna say, I want a lower rate, or I want a lower payment, or I want cash out. And where the issue stands is that as loan officers, we'll just take that for what it's worth and just say, okay, this guy wants cash out, what do you want? How much cash out? 25,000, okay, what are you gonna do with the cash out? Um, 25,000 to pay off credit card debt. Okay, cool, pay off credit card debt and the loan officer will move on. But when you find out what their real intent is, you'll be able to find out what influences them to make a buying decision. You'll be able to influence them to act with urgency if you can de decipher what their true intent is. So let me give you an example. An intent for, for, let's say, a prospect calling in just to lower their interest rate. Right? Let's just say they got a three and a half and this is no longer available in the market, but they're calling in and say, hey, Daniel, you know what, before I begin, you know, I just want to make sure, can you beat my three and a half on a 30 year fix? I don't want to pay no cost and I want it done in 21 days. Can you do this? And you know, one of the responses would be, okay, great question. Well, let me ask you, if I were able to create the savings in the lower payment that you're looking for, side note, that's what they're looking for. They're not looking for a lower rate. Traditionally, consumers are wired by society and by the media to ask for a lower rate because this is how consumers digest the information of mortgage. They're not subscribed to a mortgage daily. They don't read the mortgage section. And so when every, any, any time the matter of mortgage comes up, the only thing that they want to know is if they can get a lower rate. But what they're really saying is they want a lower payment. And so you'll notice that I'll, I'll maybe jump in and say, okay, great, if I can help you you know, secure that, that lower monthly payment and create that savings, what would you do with the savings? And that question now leads me to their intent. And so if Mr. Jones, the prospect says, well, I'm gonna use that monthly savings so I can pay my daughter's car off, she just started driving last year, and the car is gonna be like $300. Okay, now I understand what the intent is. I understand what motivates Mr. Jones. It's not the lower rate. It's having the ability to provide their child with a car. It actually goes deeper than that. That $300 car payment could have been a $100 car payment, but why? Why was it 300? Did they have to go with the extra features? Did they really need to go with the ABS brace? Absolutely, because that's his daughter. And so I'm gonna lean on that. I'm actually, I'm not right away, but I'm gonna remember that. And so if I, Later on, get any objections, I could say, okay, well, I could show you how to create most savings so you can afford the safest car for your daughter. This is what's going to impact them. This is something that no other loan officer is gonna say because they just took the cash out to buy a car as the goal or lower rate as the goal and then they jumped in and negotiation at the very beginning without understanding these, these these bullet points, right? They're not understanding these pieces, these pillars, if you will, to properly sell the prospect. Now the final is sell. You'll notice that sell or selling is the very last piece at the bottom. And ironically, it spells this. T-H-I-S. So the question is, well, hi, Daniel, what do I do? How do I do it? Well, you do this. <laughs> and that's trust, hear, intent, and selling. The reason why selling is at the very end is because only after you earn trust and after you heard them out and understood what their intent is, now you could properly sell them. Mind you, a lot of time that we are in a market that is determined by interest rates or the, mar or the market itself, right? Like there could be a good day in the bad part of the market. You have to move beyond selling rate and fees. If you continue going down that path in a rate and term fee mindset, you're gonna lose because rates are going up. So naturally, if you're just committed on selling interest rates and pricing, and you're just wanting to whore out the price to make a quick sale, it really just means that you're trying to kind of take a shortcut and say, okay, I want the lowest price here is a sale. That's not sales. That's actually just assisting someone. It's assisting someone to find the bathroom. Like, hey, I, hey, Daniel, I just want 3% fixed. Can you get it? And then, you know, you just give them the answer. Like, okay, well, no, nah, I'm not going to be 3%. You have to dig in a little bit deeper and find out what their true reason is as to why they need that lower rate, which basically is a lower payment. And of course means that they need some monthly savings. They need breathing room. And there's a reason why they need breathing room 
we just need to find out what that is. Until we get all these factors, we cannot start selling. If we start selling, we're just gonna really set ourselves up to, to fail. Now, what the thing, what, where it all actually comes together though, is most of the time as loan officers, we actually have these things in reverse. So instead of trust being up here, they're trying to earn trust at the bottom, at the very end, which I can't knock you. You, know, you should always definitely earn trust, whether it's the first or the last thing. But the issue is they start selling up here, right at the very beginning. And that's all because they received that objection from Mr. Jones at the very beginning of the conversation saying, well, Daniel, you know, before I even give you any information, just let me know if you can give me 3% fixed. I want it for free. I don't want no cost. I don't want to do an appraisal. I don't even want to give you my income documents. Can you get this for me or not? And then they immediately jump into selling and then they hear the objections and then they finally figure out, well, what their intent is, is lower pricing or lower rate. And then they try to earn the trust. Well, Mr. Jones, I have the lowest rates available. Please let me try to, to get it from my pricing manager or lock desk. Or let me call you next week if the market improves. Please, will you answer my call, Mr. Jones? You know, that's where they're trying to get the trust. But Mr. Jones has already left you. They're onto the new competitor. And ironically, what that happens is it just leaves you with shit. You have to go through the full application. If you want to know the answer on how to deflect objections right at the very beginning, again, download my script, my sales script. It's very easy to use. It's not like it's three pages long. It's very, very effective. And I promise you, it'll deflate a lot of the resistance, a lot of the barriers that are stopping you from conducting your sales conversation. But if you want to know how to get past and actually handle those objections, check out the playlist on YouTube at Sales Remastered. And if you have not subscribed to the channel links below, please do so. Support the brand. Like the video if you found value. Comment below on what your takeaway was and share this video on your YouTube, your LinkedIn, on your Twitter feed if you have one, and let everyone else know that there is an answer to sur survive this market. You know, there's a lot of loan officers who are floating around right now whose incomes are going to take a major dip this year because the market is not a rate and term market. I'll see you on the next video. Another Nick, no banger.